Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, heart attack, stroke, uh, cancer, disability prevention. Today we're going to be talking about the number one cause of significant long-term disability. That's a stroke. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> for those of you who have heard the term stroke but don't really know what it means, it's loss of blood to a, a portion of the brain. It's, um, that can be through hemorrhage or blood getting out of the artery or vein, or it can be through a clot, more often through a clot. This diagram is uh, basically representing a um, stroke from a clot, which was due to atrial fib. Atrial fib is going to be a big part of this video because it's now a big part of stroke prevention. So let's look at some of the numbers around uh, stroke. First of all, there's a gender issue here. 55,000 more women each year have a stroke than men. Every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke. So since this video began, there have been oh, two strokes in the U.S. since you've been watching it. Uh, one out of four strokes occurs in people that have had a stroke. Strokes are, there's some debate around this. So this one says strokes are the number five cause of death in the U.S. right now. Other information would indicate that it's the number three cause of death. That's not really as important as the first fact that we talked about, and that is it's the number one cause of uh, significant long-term disability in this country. As our patients begin to see us, they first start, start talking about, I want to have my heart attack or stroke later. Then they begin talking about, I want to be healthy. I want to prevent disability. That's what stroke's all about. You see it also with uh, congestive heart failure. You see significant disability with um, type 3 diabetes or Alzheimer's. Again, all of these are very much related to that same cardiovascular inflammation process that we've talked about many times in these videos. And this may be the most important statistic. 80% of strokes can be prevented. Now, <clears throat> how do you prevent a stroke? Well, we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, but let's talk about uh, some more statistics. This was pulled from the uh, CDC webpage on strokes. Um, a lot of the same information we just talked about. Uh, more women than, than men dying from stroke. Um, leading cause of serious long-term disability. Three quarters of strokes happen among uh, people that are 65 or older. One quarter uh, still happens in people younger than 65. And a positive couple of uh, statistics down here, there's actually been a decrease in stroke rate. That's part of the reason why there's the debate about whether stroke is the number three or number five cause of death. It's decreasing, and here's why. The number one risk factor for stroke is high blood pressure. In our country, we have, even with the fairly low standards of medicine that we practiced with as a society, we still have had huge impact on stroke, and we've had that impact by managing high blood pressure. Now, <clears throat> the big challenge in, in uh, stroke prevention is atrial fibrillation. Well, first of all, what's atrial fibrillation? This is a cross-section of the heart. This is a heart that's beating normally, and this is a heart with atrial fibrillation. This is what we call the sinus node, or the pacer of the heart. These arrows represent the conduction system of the heart to coordinate the beat throughout the heart. These areas are coordinating the beat to have a coordinated beat for the atria to fill the ventricles. This is the left ventricle. It's got a lot more muscle mass and the right ventricle, which has less because it only has to pump to the lungs. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the conduction system stops here at the AV node. That stands for the atrioventricular node. It gets filtered for a minute, and then it creates another system down here in the ventricles for a coordinated ventricular beat. Here's where the EKG uh, reflects this. Each, this is, each beat 
is shown here. Each bead is, this is called a QRS uh, complex. It's preceded by a P wave, a small P wave. That wave is this, uh, atrial contraction. The QRS wave is where the conduction and contraction is going throughout the ventricle. And then this T wave at the end is where the, T, where the ventricles relax. Now two things happen in atrial fib. You get what's called uh, usually an aberrant conduction. In other words, instead of going all the way, all ending up uh, as a dead end or in the AV node, you often get a connection between these two. If you get a connection, you can start getting circular movement. In other words, that can then lead to chaos. So, <clears throat> that's what's happening here. And here's the two things that happen on the EKG. First of all, you lose that P wave. There is no P wave. This is the T wave from the previous QRS. This is the T wave from the QRS. And there are no P waves because there are no, there is no coordinated contraction of the atria. The second thing that you see is the regularity of the beats. As you see here, this is regular. It looks like about a rate of 60. Uh, this is a rate of maybe 70, 80, 90, preceded by a uh, rate of more like, what, 40 beats per minute, and followed by a rate of 40 beats per minute. So you get boom, 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 boom. You get a chaotic rhythm. A random rhythm. That's because you've got all of these um, conductions going through the atria and hitting the AV node. So the AV node is just, uh, again, it's not getting a regular pacer from the atria. So loss of P waves and an irregularly irregular rate. Now do you feel it when you have uh, atrial fib? Sometimes you don't feel it at all. Uh, some patients feel tired when they have prolonged atrial fib. Others can feel a flutter. Uh, so how do we, if this is a major risk factor for stroke, it's important for us to know. And if, patient, if the patient has no symptoms, how do we figure that out? We'll talk about that in just a minute. That is one of the key points in preventing strokes due to atrial fib these days. Let's talk for a minute about what causes the stroke? Remember, this is an artery. We've seen this several times before. This is an artery getting more and more and more plaque. This is, um, we used to think, and a lot of people still do, that basically when, the, when you get so much plaque that it blocks the artery, that's when you get a heart attack or stroke. That's not what happens. When the immune system finds the heart attack, or the plaque, and starts trying to um, digest it. it. It creates dead cells. These dead cells uh, can spew out. It's a liquid. It turns the waxy substance of plaque into a liquid. And then that liquid, if it touches the blood, can cause a, a thrombus or a clot. The thrombus or the clot is the type of um, stroke that you see with atrial fib. Now, <clears throat> so let's be thinking about how to find and what to do with atrial fib if we may not have symptoms. So this is an old um, protocol for management of atrial fib. Newly discovered atrial fib. Uh, persistent, then you start doing some things. Uh, paroxysmal. Paroxysmal means it happens on an occasional basis, you, uh, uh, sometimes as rarely as a few minutes every two or three months. So <clears throat> the perception that there's a clot that forms in the atria and that clot goes up to the brain, that was in that first, uh, that first drawing. That's probably a little bit of a naive perception. I don't think that's what's going on. And this is one of the reasons that shows that. Another reason is they've actually even done trials where they went to the atria and sewed up what's called the oracles, the uh, flap on the atria where they thought clots might form. No, no significant impact on stroke uh, impact. 
the stroke risk appears to be relate in atrial fib appears to be related to uh, clots and inflammation. Now here's where this was an old um, protocol. If they found paroxysmal atrial fib, they said uh, nothing else to do. Well, that's wrong. What we've got to do is figure out what level of anti-clotting we need to do with these individuals. And why do we need to do that? Well, <clears throat> there's a thing called cryptogenic stroke. We used to know that uh, some strokes were caused by atrial fib, but, we, but most strokes we never knew the reason for it, never knew the cause. Uh, as we started looking more deeply, what we started finding is that a huge number, a larger and larger portion, at first we thought maybe a quarter of these cryptogenic strokes were actually caused by paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Well, as you look further, it looks like maybe a third, maybe a half, maybe even more of cryptogenic strokes were originally caused, related to and caused by paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So in 2014, uh, the New England Journal, the number one journal in terms of uh, uh, standards changing medicine. Well, they changed the standard here in terms of say, looking for atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. What they started doing is saying, look, if we have um, evidence of atrial fibrillation, the standard at that point in 2014 was to do what's called a 24-hour Holter monitor, 24-hour look back to, or look to see if there was any atrial fibrillation. They added other types of uh, monitoring, and they found significant improvement. So that created what we would call level one evidence, uh, randomized clinical trials. You can't do any better than that. The level one evidence that if there's suspicion of atrial fib, we need to be digging a lot deeper than just a 24-hour Holter monitor. Before that, it was just an EKG with a rhythm strip. 24 hours is not good enough either. So, <clears throat> what is the best thing? Well, I will tell you this. There are several different methods of doing this. One is a monitor that uh, you wear with and carry with you for about a month. They even have implantable monitors, which last for many months. There are now even iPhone components that help you find atrial fib if, you, if there's any suspicion of atrial fib. I actually use this. I've, this has been out for about four or five years. I've used it for a while. I've begun recommending it for my patients now uh, where there's any question of atrial fib. Um, <clears throat> what's the level of evidence for this Alive Core Cardia Atrial Fib Monitor? It's, um, it would be more like level five. There haven't been clinical trials that I'm aware of for that specific intervention. There have been uh, several experts like Eric Topol, uh, cardiologist, editor of um, Medscape, uh, big into science. Uh, he was either at Cleveland Clinic or Mayo, did a lot of work there, um, and has been at the Scripps Institute as well. So again, we need to be looking for atrial fibrillation if there's any evidence of it. What do we do next? Let's say we find atrial fibrillation. We start looking at um, anti-clotting interventions. Well, we've got that, don't we? We've got aspirin. And most patients that I see that have any evidence of atrial fib are already on aspirin. Well, let's look a little bit deeper at what this shows us. This is uh, atrial fib and risk of stroke, uh, this is placebo, and this is aspirin or antiplatelets. 22% improvement. This is clopidogrel and uh, aspirin versus aspirin alone. Another 28% improvement. And then you start looking at, uh, at warfarin, uh, 
So we're talking about some fairly heavy duty anticoagulants here. You get much improvement in terms of stroke prevention with anticoagulation. So let's think about it again. Aspirin is antiplatelet. It keeps the platelets from starting a clot. Warfarin and the newer oral anticoagulants actually have a different mechanism. They decrease the uh, clotting mechanism itself. And look at the results that you see with those. This is dibigitran. There's some others on here. They show significant decrease in stroke compared to warfarin, compared to um, uh, clopidogrel and asp aspirin and to aspirin alone. So the reality is this. We know if we get the patient on the right medicine, some of the newer oral anticoagulants, we greatly decrease the patient's probability of having a stroke. We also know that there are a lot more uh, strokes that were caused actually by atrial fib than we ever knew before. Now, there's one final question, and that has to do with, well, what if there was, um, actually, there's two final questions. Pardon the length of this video. I probably should have turned it into two. There's been a lot of um, discussion about, okay, who needs this? Everybody with atrial fib? No. There are formulas. So if you're a female, that greatly increases your risk for stroke. If you're over age 65, that increases your risk for stroke. If, you're, uh, if you have vascular disease already, all of these increase your risk for stroke. If you're a young male, 60 years old, with no cardiovascular problems, you probably don't need one of these oral anticoagulants. We've gone through several different versions of testing formulas. The first one was CHAD, then CHAD2-VASC, now CHAD2-VASC2, and HASBLED. These are all formulas. I won't go into them, but they are basically ways of uh, estimating the individual patient's risk for stroke if they have atrial fib. Next question. So let's say I had atrial fib. We discovered it. We did an ablation. In other words, we had one of those aberrant conduction areas. We went in. I had surgery. Uh, and it was, and I had it ablated. I don't have atrial fib anymore, doc, so I don't need a NOAC, right? A new oral anticoagulant. Maybe not so true. There's, there's been a good bit of debate about that in the past. Does curing the atrial fib do away with the need of a neural, the new oral anticoagulants? Here, here's an article which uh, speaks to that somewhat. It's basically showing recurrence. So even in a successful cure for atrial fib, you get up to half recurrence. And unfortunately, you don't know sometimes that that atrial fib has recurred. There have actually been other studies around this, and uh, the, <clears throat> the evidence would indicate even if you've had, quote, a cure for your atrial fib, you should go through the evaluation with your doc on whether or not you need one of the newer oral anticoagulants. This has been a very long video. Apologize for it being so long. Thank you for your attention.